good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. I'm personally really excited for this talk by our very own Tom Payne. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to let you know a couple of things that the Wellesley Historical Society has coming up. If you have not already purchased your ticket for the Sunday, March 10th, tea tasting with Jeannie Goddard, um, please do so. We have about 10 tickets remaining as of Friday afternoon. Um, so this event does require advanced registration. You can pay at the door if you do not appreciate or want to uh, pursue my credit card portal. Um, so please let me know. Um, I have some business cards over by where John's standing. Um, so it does require an email. Um, I unfortunately have a great memory, but can't remember everything um, this afternoon. <laughs> um, and then beyond that event, I wish um, to let you guys know to just save the date for our really exciting uh, Swing Into Spring event on May 9th. That's a Thursday night, um, and we'll be honoring the family of Anderson's Jewelers. And if any of you wish to sponsor, yes, it's extremely wonderful. We're really excited that they have accepted um, our, our extension of um, an invite to honor them this year. Um, so if any of you uh, wish to sponsor or know of any uh, company or entity that would want to do so, um, once again, please let me know. Um, we are seeking supporters. Um, and as always, uh, your contributions and support of the organization um, are very um, important and instrumental in um, sustaining us and enabling us to do um, educational programs uh, such as our lecture series. And we, um, we have a huge debt of gratitude um, to Christine Meyer, um, who has uh, sponsored this lecture series. So um, without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce our own John Durlam. <laughs> Some of us don't use a microphone for reasons that will become obvious. But uh, anyway, um, thanks very much, Amanda. A couple of things. One, I want to thank Kathy Betcher from the Wellesley Free Library, who is here and has always been a very uh, major part of setting this room up and getting everything ready and being sure that the uh, PowerPoint presentations work. Uh, so, Kathy, thank you. Also, I don't think, is Chris Meyer here? I don't think so. She may be in Florida, actually. But Chris is our corporate sponsor of the whole series. She is a broker mm -hmm. uh, with a Caldwell Banker here in Wellesley and has been our sponsor for the last several years, which is a delight. Two other things just very quickly on coming events. On uh, March 31st, our next lecture here, which is a Sunday afternoon, will be Melinda Ponder, who is the most recent biographer of Catherine Lee Bates, speaking on Catherine Lee Bates, uh, probably the best known person in the history of the town of Wellesley. Hmm. On May 16th, we will have someone we've had before, Eric J. Dolan, a local historian lives up in Marblehead, oh. and uh, Eric is gonna be talking on one of my favorite topics, which is piracy in New England in the 17th and 18th century. Um, so those should be good. However, they will not be any better than the one we're gonna hear this evening uh, or this afternoon with uh, Tom Payne. Um, Tom, our speaker, is a member of the Wellesley Historical Society Board. He has spent about uh, 40 years as a landscape architect in the Boston area with a primary emphasis recently on sustainability and on using public spaces basically to create a greater sense of community. Uh, which I think is a wonderful uh, objective in many respects. Um, Tom holds degrees in architecture of BA and an MA from uh, Harvard University, that little place on the other side of the river. Um, and uh, Tom also has an MBA from the University of Virginia. Um, now, in addition to his important role in the Wellesley Historical Society, Tom has been a board member of some lesser known groups like the Massachusetts Historical Society, the <laughs> Colonial Society of Massachusetts, the Longfellow House Trust, and not surprisingly, the Robert Treat Payne Trust, who is his direct ancestor and a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, Tom is also working on a book about his family throughout, basically, um, throughout history. And um, I'm looking forward to it because I think if you know the history of the Payne family, uh, especially here in New England, in many respects, you know a good chunk of the history of the United States of America. And I think that'll become a little clearer tonight when Tom talks about his family's role in the uh, Civil War. So without any further ado, I give you Tom Payne. Well, thank you, John. Can everybody hear me in the back? 
Great. Uh, John, thank you for that, that really generous introduction, because I think you overstate um, uh, the, the aspirations of my, of my book project, America's DNA, how one family uh, did its part to advance the American experiment over, over three centuries. Today, though, I'm going to talk about uh, the descendants, uh, some of the descendants of perhaps the least well-known of the founding fathers of Massachusetts. We've all heard of John Adams, Sam Adams, John Hancock, even Elbridge Gerry. But Robert Tree Payne, not so much, even though he was our first attorney general. Uh, he worked with John Adams on creating the first, uh, the, uh, the first oldest continuously uh, uh, enforced constitution in the world, the Massachusetts Constitution. But we don't know much about him. He often talked in his, in his occasional writings about the posterity of, the, of his generation. What were they doing and how long was it even going to be uh, in effect into the future? Uh, benefiting future lives uh, of, of the nation's posterity. He would have been shocked to find that his own personal posterity were going to be deeply involved in the darkest moment in the nation's history, something he could not have possibly have foreseen. But he would have also been shocked to realize that, I, that very few of the founding fathers of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, very few of them had skin in the game, if I can use that terrible metaphor, during the Civil War. Very few. I've done a lot of research on this, and it's really surprising to me that um, more uh, descendants of those founding fathers weren't, weren't signing up to fight. In the case of Robert Tree Payne, he had nothing to apologize for. His grandson, Charles Cushing Payne, was a lawyer, class of 1827 uh, at Harvard, married a judge's daughter, Fanny Cabot Jackson, uh, whose father, Judge Charles Jackson, um, codified real estate law uh, for, the, for Massachusetts and so on, lived in downtown Boston. They lived across the street. Fanny's sister, Amelia Jackson, married a gentleman named Oliver Wendell Holmes. So they were well connected. Charles and Fanny went on to have uh, eight children. And in the mid-1850s, you think, well, all is well with the Payne family. Well, the, the, the situation nationally may be turning dark, but here are three of, the, of, the, of those eight children posing happily together in a Southworth and Hawes daguerreotype in 1853. Helen, Marianne, and on the right, an eight-year-old boy named Sumner. Look at his uniform. Look at his uniform, because the Holmes is also in about that same moment, I just, I just discovered this, the Oliver Wendell Holmeses were also sending some of their kids to be photographed, to be daguerreotyped. And look at Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. on the right of this, almost in the same uniform. Well, they're going to be wearing uniforms of a different type uh, 10 years thereafter in the same regiment, not at the same time, but in the same regiment uh, fighting for, uh, uh, for, for the Union. But all was not well with the Payne family at this particular moment. In fact, when the ninth child was born, Carrie, at age two, with a, with a bout of measles, the parents decided to administer laudanum. But they doubled down on the dose, and it killed the infant, their ninth child. And, and the father mourned, this is the first child we ever lost. Now, we don't say things like that now, but in this generation, Families lost children to illness and all kinds of things. They'd been done very well. They had eight children, all healthy. They lost their ninth, and that was the tipping point. The marriage was about to dissolve by the end of the 1850s. They went to Europe to try to save the marriage. Their eldest son at that point uh, was pushing 30 years old. Uh, Charles Jackson Payne, my great-grandfather, uh, had tried. Uh, he was in the class of 1853 at Harvard. He rode for Harvard in the first Harvard-Yale, it's the first intercollegiate uh, sporting event in, in, our, in our nation's history, the Harvard-Yale boat race that took place on Lake Winnipesaukee. He became a lawyer, but he hated the law. He tried practicing out in St. Louis. By the end of the 1850s, he's back in Boston, wondering what he's going to do next. He's bored with the law. It's not his thing. And so, when war breaks out, when Abraham Lincoln is elected president, and the states, uh, the southern states start to secede, and, and John Andrew is elected that abolitionist governor of Massachusetts, and war breaks out in Fort Sumter in early 1861, Charles Jackson Payne and some others like him did the, th the thing that they felt that they needed to do. They've
volunteered to fight. And Charles Jackson Payne was going to be in uniform for the next four years th through the end of the war. He began as a captain raising a regiment on Boston Common. He was training on Boston Common. He heads to Virginia. Not much happens. He comes home with typhoid fever. Um, his father and mother are getting divorced at that point. So there's a secession and disunion on a national level and personally in the Payne family that all of his siblings, who I will be presenting to you uh, over the next 15 minutes, had to deal with each in their own way. And so while he's uh, signing up to fight and he goes back to fight with Governor uh, General Benjamin Butler, who hails from Lowell, Massachusetts. He was a portly general. Not everybody's ide ideal example of how a general should comport oneself, but he had an idealistic impulse in him when he's uh, outside New Orleans uh, in the middle of the fight, and, and Charles Jackson Payne was a colonel under him. But meanwhile, back in Boston, on the home front, a young girl, a 15-year-old girl, my great-grandmother, Julia Bryant, who's about to be orphaned. She's a da the daughter the granddaughter, I should say, of a China trader named John Bryant of the of Bryant and Sturgis. But she's a kid who's deeply involved in that moment. Wars are breaking out, uh, battles are breaking out throughout the South. And in the telegraph office window on Washington Street, everybody is wondering what, who has died now? What is the latest war, so latest battle, and who, is, who, is, who are the latest casualties? And I see great emphasis in this drawing for a 15-year-old girl. She's showing a bunch of, and I brought the original for anybody who really wants to see it. 1862, Julia Bryant's drawing of late breaking news. Meanwhile, Charles Jackson Payne's sisters are also involved on the home front. They're all deeply involved. In fact, the lady on the right, on the left here, Sarah Cushing Payne, is involved immediately in a group called the Newsboys School because all those newsboys who are delivering so much late breaking news, and there's a, such a demand for news about the war. They're spending so little time in school that some of the ladies in town say, we've got to do something about that. You newsboys have to have, you've got to get schooled on hours that are more convenient for you. And so she's involved in founding the Newsboys School. And a bunch of other uh, assignments and, and, and ways that she contributes on the home front, sort of, uh, sort of mirroring what her brother and her brothers, plural, are doing on the battlefront with the Boston Female Aid Society, the Children's Aid Society. There are lots of aid societies so that in this generation, it comes to a head that volunteerism is a big thing. I think in the generation of Robert Tree Payne, the signer, there's hardly any of that. But in the ensuing decades and coming to a full head during the Civil War, volunteerism is a very, very big part of it. Her sister, Mary Ann, the same thing. Girls Fraternity Club, Boarding House for Working Girls, Boston Female Asylum all volunteer activities that they carried on throughout their lives. They never gave up, not even when the war was long over. They continued to, to volunteer. And so what's this privileged young Charles Jackson Payne made of? He has yet to prove himself. But when people look back on his life, they said, the one thing I remember about General Payne is, and he becomes a general, is his coolness under fire. Well, he had prove himself. But he did so at the siege of Port Hudson. This is a, a Confederate stronghold on the base of, at, at the mouth of the Mississippi River, well above New Orleans I should say, that controlled all the navigation on the Mississippi River. And so Colonel Payne, uh, at the head of his brigade, reports with a rather matter-of-fact tone, I think, in a letter uh, that has survived. I've got his letters and they've been microfilmed and shared with, with, the, with history, historical societies. But this is what he says to his father in such a matter-of-fact way. My loss was 118 killed and wounded, none missing. About 500 went into the fight. A piece of shell struck me in the side, one of my upper ribs, but only bruised me. And that's the tone that stays with him throughout his reporting, dutifully reporting back to his very, very concerned father. But what he observes at this moment in his career, and I should say at this moment in his career, um, that Charles Jackson Payne is not yet an abolitionist. He, he admits as much. He says, I didn't, I didn't enter this war being an abolitionist. He's for union. But that's also true of Abraham Lincoln himself in his first inaugural address. He's not talking about abolition yet. He's talking about a more perfect union and the better, better angels of our nature, but he's not talking about abolition yet. But even worse, in Charles Jackson Payne's letters, when he talks about uh, the, the, the promise of blacks in uniform, 
he uses some language that today would be considered extremely pejorative. He uses the N word. He uses the D word. I think some of you probably know what I mean by that one. But his language is going to evolve because what, evolve because what Charles Jackson Payne shows is he's, he's capable of personal growth um, and forming a more perfect version of himself. But what he's observing at Port Hudson, leading um, his own 2nd Louisiana, not to be confused with the 2nd Louisiana Colored Regiment, also under Benjamin Butler, who uh, lead themselves to glory uh, in the siege of Port Hudson. Now, this is two months before Robert Gould Shaw's 54th Massachusetts Regiment uh, goes on to glory on the coast of South Carolina. So it's already in play, and it begins pretty much under Benjamin Butler, um, and Charles Jackson Payne is watching. But for his, uh, for his valor and for his leadership and his conduct during the siege of Port Hudson, uh, Charles Jackson Payne is promoted, uh, is elevated to Brigadier General as of, well, July 4th, 1864. And now he's heading with Benjamin Butler uh, to the outskirts of Richmond, Virginia to see what they can do to capture the Confederate capital. And it's the third division colored of the 18th Corps. So now General Payne has under his command black troops, freed blacks, four divisions under him. Uh, four brigades under him, I should say. And off they go to the outskirts of Richmond, Virginia, to a place called Newmarket Heights. This is probably the least well-known, important battle in involving black troops of the entire Civil War. 1864, Newmarket Heights, September 29th. And here are some of the soldiers proudly posing after the battle. And what Charles Jackson Payne writes to his father, again, demonstrates his coolness under fire. He says, I'm not yet hit, though a ball went through my horse's neck within a few inches of me. Very heavy. One brigade commander wounded. Most of the staff officers of two brigades, three field officers, and about one half the officers of the regiments engaged were killed or wounded. What he doesn't write here, but is known is that a third of his 3,600 soldiers uh, were casualties in this victorious storming of the heights, of Newmarket Heights. And because of this, because of this, those troops under General Payne were awarded the first Congressional Medals of Honor ever awarded to black troops. That's just not known. I mean, it's just not widely known. One of them, Sergeant Major Christian Fleetwood, he was a free, a free black, born free. Uh, Sergeant Major, he won a, a Medal of Honor uh, he, was, he was unanimously recommended for promotion into the, into the higher ranks of, of the, of, uh, for it, as, a, as a major, and he was nixed by Edwin Stanton because the racism continued at the top, right to the end of the war, in fact. They just were not going to uh, uh, be completely objective in, in their view of black troops, even at the uh, War Department on the Union side. In addition to that, Benjamin Butler, who had a thing about proving what blacks could do, he was so supportive of this idea, uh, he commissioned his own medal, a second medal, shown here on the right. This, you, can see, you can see one of them um, in the African American Museum on Beacon Hill. Uh, it says U.S. Colored Troops, um, and they were awarded to all of those uh, victorious black soldiers um, under, who served under General Payne. And so, at this particular moment, it's really not surprising that a black reporter for the Philadelphia Press, Thomas Morris Chester, would write, Payne's division, quote, had covered itself with glory and wiped out effectively the imputation against the fighting qualities of colored And so, again, uh, Jackson Payne is promoted um, from Brigadier General, General to Major General as of February 1865. He's involved on, off the coast of North Carolina, storming Fort Fisher with his soldiers, and finds himself uh, through the 1865 stationed in North Carolina, and in a kind of a quiet moment, um, uh, makes a remarkable discovery that I will uh, mention after I first uh, mention what he says uh, on behalf of his troops. Now he's calling them my men. My men have enjoyed them. They know more than anyone gives them credit for, and they have appreciated their position as conquerors, though they have behaved well, he writes 
his father on a very fraught day, April 15th, 1865. A very fraught day indeed because spent theater. Okay, so I say woke in 1865. Payne writes his father on July 2nd, 1865. The colored people are stirring the Negro suffrage question. I am going to stir them up a little more and let the colored soldiers express an opinion. It is a thing that must be done before the South can be trusted to herself. Yet some union men propose separate poor houses for blacks, supported by separate taxes on blacks, and all sorts of oppressive distinctions of that nature. Now, does anybody notice anything interesting about the wording here? Well, basically, he's using colored, Negro, and blacks all in one paragraph. It's just kind of his, his get to sort everything out. And so while he's stationed in a moment of quiet on the, off, uh, on the North Carolina coast outside of Wilmington, he learns that the sword that had been in Robert Gould Shaw's hand during the siege of Fort Wagner in July of 1863, is in the temporary custody of a Confederate soldier not far away from Wilmington. And so he sends some of his black officers to fetch the sword so they can be turned, returned to its rightful owners, the Shaw family. So it's to General Payne that we owe that little impulse because that sword, which was remained undiscovered in the attic of a Shaw descendant somewhere on the North Shore, I believe, uh, turned up in 2017. Uh, turned up in 2017. So whatever other swords you've seen that they say Robert Gulshaw was holding, like at the African American Museum, not true. This is the original one, and the provenance is clear, the markings on the sword, all the rest of it. It's, I think, one of the top ten artifacts of the Mass Historical Society, uh, at the Mass Historical Society. So go to sometime. Anyway, after the war, Charles Jackson Payne courts the now 20-year-old Julia Bryant, who's drawing I showed you earlier. They get married. Uh, they, go, uh, they get married in 1867, and a year later, their firstborn child, their son, they decide to name Sumner, the name of Charles Jackson Payne's kid brother. So before I talk about Sumner, who really, for me, is the heart of everything, Charles Jackson Payne, just briefly, the coolness under fire that he learned on the battlefield, being able to organize information, which he had to do when he was running his, his brigades, and, and he's no, he was known for that. He applied in the boardroom of three transcontinental railroads, trying to see if they could do any better job of running railroads than Jay Gould and all those unscrupulous people uh, and Collis Huntington and their ilk elsewhere. This is the Chicago, Burlington, Quincy Railroad, the Atchison, Topeka, Santa Fe Railroad, and another one, the uh, Mexican Central Railroad that Payne was on, the, was a director of, starting in the mid-1870s. And at one point, there was a, a locomotive called the General C.J. Payne, because they sometimes like to name their locomotives after their directors. And uh, Payne, I, I think it's Payne who basically said, I'm not going to, I don't like that, because the name on this locomotive actually got changed after about a year. But um, briefly, uh, there it was, the General C.J. Payne locomotive. This is a restoration done by, a uh, conjectural view done by my son Sumner. Okay, um, one more thing about him. Coolness under fire, organizing uh, uh, complicated enterprises. Uh, to, uh, he applied also in the first international sporting event, the America's Cup races. Uh, and in the mid-1880s, was responsible for three consecutive years of victory for the America's Cup defense, with boats named Puritan, then the Mayflower, and in the third year, the Volunteer. Now, we can imagine why Payne would like to name the first boat the Puritan. He had Puritan ancestors, or the Mayflower. Yes, he did have a, a Mayflower ancestor. The Volunteer clearly has to stand for his own volunteering, and maybe even as well for the black troops who are volunteering to fight for the Union. In any case, in 1887, Faneuil Hall was decorated in such a way to honor Payne and his crew and his, and his boat designer in a ceremony that was attended by 6,000, all shaking Payne's hand. And when Payne, Payne was a man of very few words, but he was introduced by Boston's mayor, Hugh O'Brien, the first Irish mayor of Boston, 
as follows. The Puritan, the Mayflower, and the Volunteer, with their owner, designer, and crews, will always be gratefully remembered by every citizen who believes in American pluck, American seamanship, and American supremacy. Well, America was a coming thing, but it was by no means a superpower by any stretch in the mid-1880s. But an international sporting event like that, well managed by someone like Payne, was showing the way. And so, let us now go back to the Civil War to Sumner Payne's kid brother, who was born in 1845, and when the Civil War breaks out, he enters Harvard as a freshman. And the class of 1865, it's hard to be in school when, a, when your older brother is, is fighting on the battlefront. When you're studying Greek and Latin, what's that all about when the war is taking place? And so there's a certain degree of restlessness. Nevertheless, he was the leading scholar, the leading athlete. He was the so-called class leader, Sumner Payne. And because of that, the Harvard faculty tried to use him to maintain discipline in his class. Well, it didn't work out that well. He was disciplined. He was suspended. He came back. He was guilty of of a prank which involves uh, going to the front door of a certain obnoxious faculty member's house and quietly at night, hopefully unobserved, screwing that door shut so that the person could not get out. Well, he got caught. But guess what? Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. had, had done the same prank and so had the person who was going to recruit him to now join the 20th Massachusetts Volunteers. So there was a certain glory in that, in that some, somewhat sophomoric uh, tradition. But anyway, in any case, he, he, he severs his relationship with the college. His father takes him to meet with Colonel Henry Lee, who's recruiting officers, especially Harvard, Harvard students, to become officers in what was called the Harvard Regiment, the 20th Massachusetts Voluntary Infantry. And so off he goes. He hasn't yet turned 18 years old. He's a Harvard sophomore. He knows nothing about, uh, about military tactics. And yet, the day after he arrives off the train on the Rappahannock River during the Battle of Chancellorsville, when his, the 20th Massachusetts, hating being stuck in Fredericksburg instead of the heart of the battle, has to uh, try to storm Mary's Heights, his cousin gets wounded. Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., who's already in the 20th Massachusetts Regiment as a captain, gets wounded. This is the second time in his career. He's going to be wounded three times before he's done, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes is. And this is what Sumner Payne, freshly arrived, almost barely in, barely in uniform, writes to his older sister Fanny, his beloved sister Fanny. Whip the rebels like the devil. Holmes, wounded in foot, I command his company. I have got ahead rather faster than I expected to. To be in action within 15 hours after I reported and have command of a company. Oh yeah, way ahead of schedule. And so his sister, who's eight years older or so, sister, uh, his sister Fanny, writes him back, dear laddie, she says, please, this is not college hazing. You've got to watch out for yourself. Please be mindful. This is serious business. Don't get carried away. And all kinds of things of that sort. She was looking out for him. She loved him deeply. In Sumner's last letter, um, he writes George Goddard, his classmate, um, after a terrible march, and before which Sumner has gotten into a little bit of trouble by realizing that he's, he's a, a neophyte, he's a little bit wet behind, under the collar, um, and that he's, nobody's going to take him seriously. He comes, down, he comes down a little bit for, too forcefully on his company in disciplining them, and they don't like it. And I think they're especially resentful of having an 18-year-old kid from Harvard who, who's not battle-hardened uh, telling them to do anything. So they're a little bit irritated with him. Well, all will be forgiven in about two or three weeks. But on the way, on June 30th, uh, after those two or three weeks, on June 30th, they're marching like crazy north. And this is what he writes his, his college classmate, George Goddard. You're heading towards Philadelphia. Oh, yes, they are. They're going to get into southern Pennsylvania once they leave Union, Maryland. Yesterday, we went 30 miles. The longest march ever made by a corps in this country. By Jove, I never want to do, go through such a thing again. Personally, personally, I didn't feel it in the least, but the responsibility of taking charge of the men is awful. I had three men faint away in the ranks. You must remember that 30 miles marching in column is as much as 50 when alone. And they're going to arrive on the second day at Gettysburg exhausted. 
exhausted and yet pick themselves up, dust themselves off and see what they're going to see what they're made of. And so on the third day, July 3rd, Friday, after General Robert E. Lee has tried the Union North and tried the Union South, he's going to go for the Union Center and decides to focus the attack on a certain copse of trees, clump of trees shown here um, with Pickett's charge, led by Lewis Armistead, who comes across the wall, creating chaos and, and all the smoke and the din, probably the largest noise ever heard in the American, North American continent was the artillery fire that preceded this. I think this artist captures maybe by half the kind of chaos that must have been there when the 20th Massachusetts position behind this scene, behind us, about 150 yards south, realizes, and, it, and Colonel Hall said, plug the gap, just go, go at it. And, and Lewis, um, and, um, and when, when General Hancock goes by, he says, get in there pretty damn quick. So they're all deciding, okay, this is where we're positioned. All bets are off, in we go. We've got, to, we've got to plug that hole as fast as we can. All the senior command for the 20th Massachusetts has already been wounded. It's really up to uh, Captain uh, Abbott and, and several lieutenants under him and beside him, like Sumner Payne, to just run as fast as they can, leading their men to plug the gap in front of the cl uh, clump of trees at Pickett's Charge. And on his way in there, Sumner Payne is brandishing his sword. He's got his pistol. He says, isn't this glorious? And then he is shot in the ankle. It completely severs his, his foot, basically. He falls to his knee, and he's still got something left. And he says, forward, forward. And he's shot again in the heart and one of his arms. And he's shot dead at the very high watermark of the entire uh, Civil War. He was in the right place at the right time. And I, as a kid, when I heard this story, I mean, this has been riveting me since, well, since the centennial of the Civil War, when I was like 12. I just was wondering, could he really have said, isn't this glorious? Well, I'm the only skeptic. I'm the only skeptic, as I will, I will show to you. July 3rd, 1863, here's another rendition, the Cyclorama edition. This is the, used to be the Boston Cyclorama. It can now be seen at Gettysburg. It shows a little bit uh, uh, tidier um, clump of trees here, not enough smoke. But anyway, uh, the 20th Massachusetts is over here. They're running in this direction, and Sumner Payne dies here about 15 feet back from the, the, the line of the fence and the, and the stone wall. But here we've got um, Alonzo Cushing on his artillery. He's got his entrails falling out, and yet he's still going to get off another shot. Uh, we've got um, um, uh, various uh, Union soldiers there, uh, one of whom, whose name is escapes me at the moment, um, who's in charge, John Gibbon. Uh, John Gibbon, his three brothers were on the Confederate side. He's on the Union side in charge of everything that's taking place here. So yes, it was brother against brother. And so, I mean, isn't it amazing? This is July 3rd, and then the next day is July 4th. That's always got to me. Every time I hear that, I think, there's just something mystical going on here. Well, two days later, um, the Union dead, scattered and yet unburied on the battlefield, were photographed uh, randomly in a few photographs. I think this is probably the best of the bunch that I've ever seen. Um, and many years later, the, uh, the daughter of another casualty that day, another descendant of a founding father, if you will, Colonel Paul Revere, who got mortally wounded on July 2nd, uh, his daughter uh, spearheaded a, 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 a movement to memorialize the 20th Massachusetts Regiment, the Harvard Regiment, by bringing a piece of none other than Roxbury Pudding Stone, shipping it to Gettysburg, and erecting it there on the site where they, where, uh, they were positioned before all hell broke, broke loose, south of the clump of trees, which actually is nearer than that. That's a little bit distorted. And that was in 1886. And of course, on November 19th, because of this battle had probably the, the greatest casualties of any battle of the Civil War, in which uh, by the end of the Civil War, the 20th Massachusetts Regiment was going to rank, I think, fourth in terms of overall casualties that were lost. But they had such um, great losses uh, in this battle that they clearly are among those um, whom, quite literally, Abraham Lincoln is referring to um, in the Gettysburg Address, this wonderful photograph that shows Lincoln coming off the podium, having given his two-minute speech, his immortal speech, that had followed the rather uh, interminable two-hour by Massachusetts' own Edward Everett. But he spoke clearly, um, as eloquently as anybody spoke, and just, um, I don't know how many of you memorized the Gettysburg Address. 
as, as school kids. Oh yeah, and it's, I, I think most of it still sticks with me, so I'm really grateful at this point for having been forced to uh, memorize the Gettysburg Address. Um, but he was, it was the Sumner Paines who died that day that he's talking about. So when Sumner, uh, when, it was, when the family had to decide what to do, father went down to visit. He said, okay, Sumner's going to remain buried. We're not bringing him back to what? Mount Auburn Cemetery? Well, some people did things like that or Forest Hill Cemetery. He should remain buried in Gettysburg. And he was. But um, his fellow officers had written letters to the father who was just insisting on information. What happened to my son? Please tell me. What were his last moments? How did he conduct himself? He just wanted to be sure that his son had behaved as well as his, as his father had always insisted he should. And so they wrote back and told uh, him about his final moments. They sent a map of where he died I, I, uh, and so on. Also sent back um, the shoulder boards and buttons off his uniform, which were lovingly preserved by his unmarried sisters for the rest of their lives. And as well, when the, when the speech, the, that short speech given by Abraham Lincoln on November 19th appeared in the local papers, Charles Cushing Payne did what any, any sane person would do. He cut it out and saved it because indeed it was speaking to um, our fathers brought forth this continent a new nation. He was probably thinking to himself, yes, uh, founding fathers and our, the Payne tribe at least, was represented here in this, in this moment of glory. So Sumner Payne is buried at Gettysburg. Um, and we know his last words because one of uh, Sumner's fellow officers wrote his father and said, uh, and, I, and, I, and I'll just read it to you, stated just a moment before he was killed, he had said to Lieutenant Sumner Hayes, so they're both running through, I don't, think, I don't think said is the right word, I don't even be shouted to Lieutenant Sumner Hayes, isn't this glorious while he was uh, rushing on waving his sword. And I was, I was really amazed when I was uh, just sort of looking online to see what was being said about Sumner Payne out there. A book called Isn't This Glorious? And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And when, then I looked at the cover of it and I said, wait a minute, they've got, a, they've got Sumner Payne on the cover of this book? This is a book not about him, about three regiments. But they're using him as kind of um, the archetypal soldier of that moment. And so I reached out to the authors and I, I went to the, needless to say, a guy like me is going to try to go to the reenactment for the 150th anniversary. And there I was, and I met Edwin Root. I invited him over to my house here in Wellesley. Um, and there he is, uh, down there, lower right. And he's holding Sumner Payne's shoulder boards. And there's a portrait of Sumner Payne on the wall, which his father had commissioned to be painted posthumously. And his diary, uh, his father's diary, where he talks July 3rd, Sumner Payne killed at the Battle of Gettysburg and so on. So Ed Root, the author of this book, who had, had no idea that he could ever uh, see any of this stuff before, and he's holding the shoulder board, said, Tom, I'm having a religious experience. Indeed so. I mean, I, I inherited this. That's very different from discovering it on your own. Much better to, um, to be the latter, much better. So I've often wondered what this guy looked like. I mean, he was my childhood hero. I wanted to be as good as he was. Um, and so eventually I, I used a little Photoshop and I superimposed Sumner Payne um, on top of his, of his fellow uh, officer's lieutenant's uniform. So he might have looked like that. Might have. Probably not, but maybe. Okay, so now there were three brothers. I haven't talked at all about William in the middle there. And th this is the great irony of this, of this group of uh, brothers and sisters because William is a career military guy. He went to West Point, and he was at the head of his class, West Point class of 1858. And you would think, oh, great. Well, he's going to shine so much. He's in the Corps of Engineers. He would very much like to have been reassigned to, um, to, uh, to the battlefront, but he's, he's simply building forts way away from the actual um, uh, where the combat is actually taking place, and something about his health gives out by 1863, and he withdraws. He, he's married, he has bad health, and he dies young. He dies by the 1880s. I do not know much about his, his, his life after that, but there's no record um, in, the, in the, family, uh, the family history that he actually uh, was involved in, in commerce or anything. I think he just drank himself to death because he, uh, he was... Um, he was known to have uh, been a drinker. So that's the irony. His two brothers who hadn't even gone to West Point, they get all the glory and he doesn't. 
So it was, it was unfair, you could see it was unfair. Anyway, Sumner Payne, the youngest um, Harvard uh, person gone to Harvard, uh, who's on the Memorial Hall at Harvard, you can go see his plaque there. Um, he was awarded posthumously his, his BA degree in 1904. He'd certainly been educated on the battlefield. So th that sister Fanny, the, who was so concerned about him, when he was uh, uh, being a little bit too cheeky on the battlefield at Chancellor's, she never marries. She joins a, a, an Episcopal order, a, a sisterhood, and she wore mourning clothes for a year or two after uh, Sumner's death. Now, her first cousin, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., sent her this view of himself, Captain Holmes, uh, well, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., Captain's uniform, 1862, sends it to Fanny. Fanny Payne from her affectionate cousin, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., sends it to her. Uh, and in 1867, this is what uh, Fanny looked like. So just to remind you of that connection, because Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. is one of the great survivors. He lives to, into his 90s and is on the U.S. Supreme Court. And he, if anybody's a spokesperson for this greatest uh, Civil War generation, if I can call it the greatest generation, it would be, uh, it would be Holmes. And here's what Holmes said. In Keene, New Hampshire, Memorial Day, 1884, kind of summing things up. He'd often spoken about being touched with fire in his youth when he fought in the Civil War, soaring rhetoric. And this is what he says. As life, as action, and passion is required of a man that he should share the action, passion and action of his time at peril of being judged not to have lived. I think he's quoting Henry David Thoreau there. Nevertheless, and I think also it's fair to say that had he lived a few more decades, he would have said, a man and a woman. But the point being made that everybody, man and woman, was affected by this war and doing what they could um, in the cause. In fact, Sister Frances Constance, as she is now called because she goes to the Sisters of Mer uh, Mercy in England, often talked about the battle of life. I mean, it's just kind of interesting to me that she uses the metaphor of battle. Uh, but we've, we've got records that, that indicate that she did just that. So she, they're helping the disadvantaged in England. This is orphans and unwed mothers and all of that. She says, well, I'm going to, the, to, to New York, which is where we really need this. And so she founds the affiliated community of St. John Baptist. This is an Episcopalian sisterhood. Uh, launches the New York presence and goes on to be the mother superior. Uh, and builds this um, headquarters where there are a lot of novices, where they're helping unwed mothers and orphans and, and all of that in the grittier uh, parts of, of New York. Well, to her, to her everlasting credit, um, she's not the one here, but in 1880, a crazed man shoots one of her novices four times, doesn't kill her, shoots her right on the, on the doorstep of that, of that building I just showed you. And so she, Sister Frances Constance um, has a problem on her hands. She's got to rally all of her troops in the room because everybody's terrified. What's going to happen next? And so she says, OK, if somebody were pointing a gun at you, what would you do? And some of them said, pray. And some of them said, have faith. And she said, no, but be perfectly willing to be shot. That's what she said. Now, it's, 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 it's like Mahatma Gandhi, but it's also like her channeling her kid brother's supreme moment when he, in, in Gettysburg, is perfectly willing to be shot. That's what she said. And I thought, it has to be, it has to be, she's thinking, she's channeling that in some, in some mystical way. And so um, she was mother superior, her health gave out, she died before her time in 1901. She had three sisters. Three sisters, two of whom I showed you before, and there was a younger sister, Helen, on the right there. All of them pretty much were volunteers uh, for the less advantaged in Boston. They never married. They lived together all their lives in a, in a modest uh, row house on Brimmer Street at the foot of Beacon Hill. Um, and to their dying days, they kept Sumner Payne's shoulder boards, buttons, and a book that I brought along uh, describing Pickett's charge. So they were, you could almost say, never forgot their kid brother. 
they volunteered to help the disadvantaged in Boston. The youngest one, Helen here, had a lot of pluck. She had an attitude. She was helping with the soup kitchens in the North End with uh, recent immigrants from, uh, from Russia and Italy and, and so on. And she taught Sunday school for 60 years, and even when she was an invalid. So she became lame, but she never gave up. And when she, um, uh, and this is Helen I'm talking about, shown throughout life there. There's a smile on her face there when she's in her older years. She became, um, so she was handicapped, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what the nature of her, of her, of her what her health issues were, but she, she always had a, a kind of spunky attitude, and she said, last words were, going into the operating room, I shall make the doctors laugh. And scores of her, of her North End uh, Sunday School students and students from other programs she was involved with showed up at her funeral that was held um, at Trinity Church in Common Square. Uh, which is a project of her, of the last sibling I want to talk about today, Robert Treat Payne II, the namesake of the founding father, who t marched to a different drummer almost from day one, because when he was an 11-year-old kid, his, his unmarried aunt, Mary Ann Jackson, said, Bob, I will give you $70 if you promise never to shoot a gun, ever again. And he said, okay, deal. And so he had that money, and he had 200 bucks that he got from his father later on, and that was all the money he was ever given. Well, he was given that, but that was all he said he was ever given, and he made his fortune entirely on his own. So here he is in midlife, but he marries, um, as the Civil War is just getting, getting underway, to um, Lydia Williams Lyman of the, the Lymans of the Vale, that family. Um, and they go on to uh, have, a, have a family, not without hardship. Some of, their ch some of their children actually do die before the time in their teens and so on. But early in their life, Robert T. Payne become, says, my classmate, Phillips Brooks, is just, is, is just um, a force of nature. Because Phillips Brooks had gone to Philadelphia to start his career as, as a clergyman. But when Harvard was holding a, 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 a program to um, honor the Civil War dead um, in 1866. They had a full program during the day, and then uh, this unknown Phyllis Brooks gets up to speak at the end of the day and absolutely riveted the moment. Everybody was in tears. Uh, Charles Sumner was there. He was in tears. Thomas Wentworth Higginson was there. He said, who is this person? We've got to get him to come to Boston. It was Phyllis Brooks. And one of the great losses to history is a copy of, of his remarks that day. But they, they were comparing it to the Gettysburg Address. So he, he is invited back to Boston to head Trinity Church, the Episcopal Church in Boston, which is in, at that moment moving out of downtown Boston due to the fires and, and the, the migration to the Back Bay and so on to a new headquarters. And it's Robert Tree Payne that uh, is the head of the Finance Committee that gets that done, always honoring Phillips Brooks. By 1870, Robert Treat Payne has made money in railroads. He's made money in investments out west. He's been a real estate lawyer. And he's, he's made a small fortune. And he says, OK, is that all there is? He has a change of heart. He says, as he recalled later about his decision age 35, as we had this life on earth only once, I was not willing to devote the last half of it to the mere business of making money. No, he's going to start giving it away. So there's something about him that's different from his brothers who are maybe than he, my, my great grandfather did not give away as much. So he helps Phyllis Brooks build Trinity Church. He hires the architect. He's the head of the finance committee. He uh, assembles a site, uh, enlarges the site so that there's no uh, abutting building. It's a freestanding building, all of that. And of course, it's the building that begat the square. Other buildings are trying to join it, and Copley Square sooner or later unfolds. But that was just the beginning of their fellowship. And on Robert Tree goes to help the disadvantaged in his own way uh, in Boston and beyond because there's an in-migration of people that are living in slums, that need education, that need opportunities, and it's not getting done by the government. It's up to private organizations to do it. This is the, the think of the time. And so Robert G. Payne becomes known as the philanthropist, saying things like this. Disorganized charity has spent too much time, too much money, done infinite harm. The great aim is the building up of character without which all is sure to fail. Not by proxy, not by coin, come yourself and help says the new charity to every man and woman. So it's building up the character, not just of your recipients, but you as donors. He was a believer ever since he'd been an investor in what he called uh, personal inspection. In other words, you go check it out yourself. Don't take anybody's 
for it. He'd done that with his investments out west, and he did that with the slums of Boston. And he went in there, no matter how rank and foul it was, and he said it was that worst curse of city life, and he was going to do something about it. And so he creates aff affordable financing, and he builds uh, uh, housing that to this day is well maintained in parts of Roxbury, and I think also Dorchester, hundreds of units of housing that he built and, and, and allowed people to get out of the slums, to own your own home, take ownership of their lives, and move on uh, in society. So this is the kind of philanthropy that absorbed uh, pain, working closely with Phillips Brooks, uh, throughout his career. He, he would even do things like, one, he built a house on Waltham, which I encourage you all to go visit, Stonehurst. Uh, it was his summer house, or I should say his spring and fall house. Uh, he lived in the city uh, in the wintertime. But he invited a lot of beneficiaries of his charities out there. I think he rented a railroad car, and he got them all out there and gave them a day in the country, well, which sounds a little bit paternalistic in, in modern terms for sure. But it was, again, Unlike other uh, uh, billionaires and donors, he was perfectly willing to surround himself uh, with people um, who, who, whose lives he was trying to, to help. They were his friends. And he did a lot of writing. He was promoting causes in, in Europe and throughout the United States. And out in Stonehurst, you can see his leather-bound homes for the people, dwellings of the poor, he calls them, his pamphlets, the People's Institute, one of his, one of his many, um, many institutions that he founded. I think there were like 45 boards that he was on, so it's just more than you could possibly imagine doing and doing it well, but he managed to. But that's not all for him. So in 1880, 1899, there was an article that appeared, um, I guess, in the Chicago, you know, the Boston Sunday Globe, of course, there it says right up there. How shall our millionaires use their wealth for the country's good? And there, side by side with John D. Rockefeller, is Robert Tree Payne. Well, I, I guarantee you John D. Rockefeller was not a hands-on uh, kind of guy. Um, no, that was a very different way to go about it. And he was, uh, this gives you a sort of a feeling for some of the institutions that he was responsible for, for creating. The People's Institute, the Working Men's Cooperative Bank. Working Men's was, was a positive term back then. Um, and he was creating low, low interest loans organizations for them. So um, they're nonprofits essentially, or, 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 or almost. But that's not all. Phyllis Brooks once said to Payne, I like the largeness of your ideas. Many a time in these last 20 years, you have saved us from doing things on a small scale and kept us large. So he's got this vision, this sense that we, we're, we're, bigger than, we're bigger than this, a kind of uh, an ambition which he wants to bring people along with him to do. And so he becomes the president of the American Peace Society, which goes back to the early 19th century. It's one of the oldest peace organizations anywhere. He takes that to the 1889 World's Fair in Paris, representing um, as an international peace advocate um, uh, and, and focusing in particular on arbitration, international arbitration, to try to forestall wars entirely. Now you could say, oh, he's just a, he's just a Pollyanna, he's just a cockeyed optimist, what does he know? And, and maybe there's, there's some truth to that, but there's more to it. Um, and then in 1899, 10 years later, he's still at it. The International Peace Conference at The Hague, and he said, it transcends any human event which has taken place. It is the first parliament of man, the first step towards the federation of the world. This is the moment when international law is, is has becoming a thing, when the League of Nations and the UN are being anticipated. Um, and there's a court, of our, a court of arbitration as well. But there's one more thing, which brings us full circle back to Abraham Lincoln, and that is the codification of war crimes, which is going to lead to the Hague Convention, which is going to lead to the Geneva Convention, um, and it's going to move forward. But Robert Tree Payne was there at the moment when at the Hague, they um, adopted something that goes back to none other than Abraham Lincoln, 1863. How many of us learn in school that Abraham Lincoln signed General Order 100 uh, codifying war crimes during the Civil War? Nope, I didn't learn about it until five years ago, maybe, by Franz Lieber, who was a, 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 a guy from Germany who was a moral philosopher and a lawyer and who authored it. And Lincoln signed it, but basically it was talking about the treatment of POWs, the exchange of prisoners, um, what were intolerable acts, um, that, um, excessive use of force, um, and more, war crimes. I mean, it even went so far as to um, added to this was a prohibition against the use of poisonous gases in wars. 
and this is way before World War I, well, which Robert Tree Payne does not, uh, f fortunately for him, doesn't, doesn't live to see. In the fullness of time, he was proven right. Pretty sure his um, namesake, founding father, ancestor would have said, well done, Robert, well done. So I've spent a lot of time, and thank you for your patience, in talking about seven people who illustrate a lot of versions of pluck that came out during the Civil War. Would it have come out if there hadn't been a Civil War? I guess so, but it certainly was brought to the fore and was given a true test under, under all kinds of um, pressures. Charles, leading black soldiers, uh, takes his coolness under fire into enterprise and peacetime competition. Sumner, valor in a noble cause. Francis, helping vulnerable women, leading a woman's organization. Sarah, Marianne, and Helen, helping underprivileged and needy. And Robert, giving back, others help themselves, world peace. And so if I had to sum all of this up and think about what's the really big picture here, especially in this fraught moment that we're now living in, in this sort of winter of our discontent moment in our own history, where we're all wringing our hands and whining about everything, I would just say there's an underlying optimism. If you ever listen to Steven Pinker, he would say, just forget all that stuff, you know, the sort of availability heuristic, which makes us all glom onto what the late break news just was. Step back. It's not as bad as you think. And that is what America's DNA is all about. Because it's all about ambition, imagination, collaboration, and compassion. Without that, we're in trouble and courage. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm done. Now, Tom, I'm quite certain that there are going to be quite a few questions from the audience, so uh, I trust you're willing to entertain them. I'll believe that when I hear one. Fire away. Uh, way in the back. What's going on at the Payne Homestead? All the boys are off at the war. They got divorced. Thank you for reminding me to, to uh, I, I neglected to say that. They actually got divorced. They, um, they tried to make that marriage work, and uh, they went to Europe, and they thought they maybe could have the kids in school there, and that the, the, the parents could actually talk to each other, which they weren't doing. They were living in the same house, but not talking to each other. Um, but then um, Fanny deserts her husband, just moves out. And then Charles, the father, says, OK, I'm going to go out to Bloomington, Indiana, to establish a desertion. And so he lives out there for a year. And divorce is declared uh, by 1861. So what you have here is a divorce. When divorce is really scandalous, people didn't divorce like we do nowadays. Um, and so it was, it was, I think there was some shame there. Um, I, I think it had some profound effect on the, on, on the daughters, is my guess. Maybe I'm over over reading into it. Does that answer the question? Well, I wonder, does dad conduct a business? Does he come back to Boston? Uh, we, we read stories about how families, home senior, corresponded with junior, and goes and hunts him down after he's wounded. And that relationship of the kids are off. Well, he's, so Charles Cushing Payne is in, is in correspondence with his son almost, almost bi-weekly. I mean, he's just this, this, this voluminous uh, collection of, of letters. Um, and all of, his, all of his children, there's just a lot of correspondence. So he's very much engaged in what they're up to. He's living through them, if you will. He's pretty much a retired lawyer. Um, and so he's got time on his hands to do that. And he's living alone. So yes, he's going to do that. Um, could he have spent his, his, that part of his life in a more productive way? Absolutely, but he didn't. And so um, he dies in 1874 and at age 66 or so, so before his time. <coughs> Any other questions? Um, just, just a follow-up to that. You mentioned the, the three sisters who never got married, uh, not surprisingly affected by the, the divorce of their parents. But also, were they also affected by sort of the dearth of potential husbands, given the, the huge casualty rates in the war? Good point. Good point. That and has often been, <laughs> that's been cited um, in, in for World War One, I, I guess, for for uh, uh, women in Britain and so on. I, it's, it's, it's distinctly a possibility. It's distinctly a possibility. But I have to imagine that that uh, in the Payne household. And they were all notoriously shy. That was often a word used. So I'm, I'm thinking they weren't, 
they weren't really um, getting out enough to really to really meet potential mates. I mean, they went to school, they did all that good stuff, and they were involved in Sunday school and meet people that way. But it, it's hard to know exactly why. But possibly yes. I, although I've never seen any anecdote that alluded to oh. Well, Charlie Putnam, that's, that's, that's it for me. He's gone. No, I haven't heard any of that. Uh, yes? Could you share a bit about your journey in the research and sort of sure. covering some of the why you took it up? Oh, I, 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 I'm just born with this, uh, with this genetic thing. I don't know what it is. But we had a lot of stuff at home. And I, by the way, I brought some things here. Those of you who are really interested in the stuff of history, check it out. Uh, so I grew up with it. Um, and the story of Sunder Payne grabbed me early. I, was, I had uh, Virginia first cousins, and we'd go down to Manassas Battlefield. I was picking up mini balls and stuff like that. So the Civil War part of it, very much. But generally speaking, I was just always a history guy. I mean, there was a Mayflower thing in the fifth grade. I can still remember painting a big mural of, uh, you know, with, the, with the Native Americans and, and, and everything. Um, so it was just in my blood. I, you know, I, 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 I'm always amazed when um, young people now when I can see myself in them, uh, like at the Longfellow House, they're coming in. Um, interestingly, um, at Gettysburg National Historic Site, I was just Googling to see what, who's saying what about Sumner Payne. Well, there was a young intern there about two years ago who's um, an undergraduate uh, history major somewhere in Illinois who totally fascinated, she's an 18-year-old kid, fascinated with the story of Sumner Payne and uh, just, just riveted by it. And um, so, and he's being discovered. So these stories, I was lucky to have them handed to me. In her case, that intern is finding it out on her own by herself. That's what we need more of. And I think, you know, as, as a public historian, I'm very concerned about the, the lack of emphasis on, on our own history because this is, it's, it's a hopeful story. We've got a lot of good stuff to share. And I'm, I never tire of talking about, we've got to share these stories more. So I'm trying to share my family stories, which are not well known. But I think they add, they enrich the story. And maybe if we don't just hear always yet again from the usual suspects and hear from these lesser well-known figures, we'll say, oh, wow. And also we can take hope and say, oh, you don't have to be a John Adams type to really make a difference. You can just be yourself. Just get out there and do it. And I think nowadays that, that lesson is as is, is, is urgently needed as ever. There, The Robert Tree Payne second house is, is off of, of Beaver Street in Waltham. Do you know where the Vale is? It's sort of across the street from that. And it's really worth visiting. You should go to the website. Look up Stonehurst, it's called. And, and under whose? It's owned by the city. And there's, there's a, uh, the Robert Tree Payne Historical Trust, which uh, works with the city to uh, help uh, maintain the historical fabric of the house and run programs there that uh, that, that further the ideals of, its, of, of Robert Tree Payne II, his um, interest in helping the disadvantaged or uh, world peace or all of that. So, so yes, so go, go visit it. Yes. <clears throat> Were any of the Payne sisters or any of the Paynes at all at the turn of the century um, <clears throat> aware of or in any way collaborating with Helen Starrow when she set up the Saturday Evening Girls organization to help the immigrants, notably in the North End, but spread beyond that, to uh, create enterprise and, and thereby earn a little living. I think they were not as entrepreneurial as, as I wish they were in that regard. I think they were much more about Sunday school and, and, and enrichment programs and so on and so forth, rather than saying, hey, I know how to run an organization. I'm going to teach you, too. I think they didn't quite have enough to do that. But um, there's certainly a lot of overlap there. And they probably all knew each other. I think it, I think it was a small community. They all knew each other. And, and behind you there? Yeah. yeah, yes. When you showed us those banners with um, Puritan Mayflower and volunteer volunteerism and um, you had just finished us telling us the story of the sisters and how they were volunteering. So I assume. Yeah. Uh, good point. Good point. I think so. I think so. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point to make. And you know what? I didn't think of it. So thank you. For, no, I'm, I'm, I learned something. That, that's a very excellent point. Yes, sir. 
very top five. Um, the lady, I can't remember the name, the 15 year old. Julia Bryant. Yeah, right here. She was a, she was an artist who who didn't get to become an artist because she got married, but she did sketches of her husband. She could do these incredible sketches of anybody ever heard of that Victorian uh, field in the woods? Uh, that's another story. But anyway, she could do wonderful wonderful uh, uh, representation sketches, narrative. She often mostly with pencil or charcoal. She did wonderful portraits of her husband and stuff like that. Uh, she, she has one of a, of a female artist. So she's got an artist at her easel. So one art, female artist depicting another. She had a lot of talent. And her, and her kids did too. Her, uh, one of her daughters, Helen, uh, became a, a really good artist. Um, yeah, so the talent was there. Uh, there's a lot of information that's wonderful that you have on the pain side of the family and much correspondence between Sumner and his dad. What happened to the mom who got divorced at that time where she stayed in Europe? Where she was also part of a Bostonian family. Good, good question. So Fanny Cabot Jackson Payne lived with her daughters while she was alive. All of them had a household together. And after she died, they just stayed together and moved to Brimmer Street. But they were on Beacon Hill at the top of Chestnut Street, I believe. Um, and so they lived together. That was, that was it. They all sort of sided with her in all this family dispute. I guess they took sides. I mean, that was sort of, I guess, a male way to look at it. You take sides in these things. But communications have been... There aren't that many communications from her. I mean, she wrote a lot in the earlier years, and I've got some of her comments on her, on her children when they were young. She's writing up how little Willie was doing this today and all that kind of... There's some wonderful family records there. It seemed like it took two of them to have instilled so much of this incredible... Well, I, I can't imagine having eight children. I can't. I just can't see it. And they did, and everything else. So, good question. Is, is there a connection to Tom? Because I've seen the Robert Tree Payne. Yes, there is. By him. Robert Tree Payne uh, in 1770 um, moved to Taunton, oh. and he lived years, and that's where his his career really got off the ground. Oh. Now, he was there in the 1760s. In 1770, he gets involved in the Boston Massacre trial. But so, two of the people I spoke about uh, in 1904 um, commissioned Edwin Brooks to create that statue and gave it to Taunton. Robert Tree Payne II and General Charles Jackson Payne, they underwrote the cost of that statue, which is it's a wonderful statue. And, and every October, they have a Liberty and Union Festival. They have the fife and drum. They're all on the Robert Tree Payne statue. It's really wonderful. But good for you for for pointing that out. That's the, that's the Taunton connection. Yeah. Were there any uh, relatives, branches of the family in the South, uh, members of the extended family that supported the Confederacy, fought for the Confederacy? And was this a divided family in any way with respect to the extended family? The question is whether um, the family had, had, had skin in the game on both sides. And we were all on the North. The Paines, I say we, the Payne family was all um, basically New England based. So unlike um, John Gibbon, who I mentioned, who's uh, at Gettysburg there, and he gets wounded, by the way, and has to leave the field, as does uh, Hancock, um, who's got three brothers fighting on the Confederate side. I mean, that's just, what could be more poignant and, and divisive and, and, and sad than that? But, but no. Yes, they were absolutely hoping that, well, they were free, and they were hoping that, that, of course, all of their brethren would also be free by the, as that was, that was what they were fighting for. And um, they were all free, they had to be free in order to be fighting uh, in uniform. But, but interesting, the, the Lieber Code, the war codes, uh, was, was, was also directed specifically at the Confederates, because what they were up to was, if they ever caught any of those black Union soldiers they wanted, they are basically just going to, they're just going to, they're going to uh, execute them. They, they had no rights whatsoever. They were going to consider them to be uh, slave property to be, re property to be returned to their owners. So that was unacceptable uh, to the Lieber, as, and that was referenced in the Lieber Code. So they were free, and they were fighting for freedom. Um, and um, the story of some of these soldiers deserves to be better known.
Well, then, one more. Yes, I'm thinking about the future, and I just wondered if you have uh, spoken uh, with any of the professors in the history departments at, uh, in Wellesley, with Wellesley College in Babson, and in Waltham at Brandeis University in Denver. I have not. That's a very good thought. I mean, I think kind of skepticism that uh, I mean, to mention, admire. Um, but um, bring it on. I think uh, there's probably something there. So, probably something there. So do we have any more questions? I mean, I'm happy to, I, I invite you all to come forward and to see, I brought a few artifacts, including uh, Sumner Payne's uh, shoulder boards and buttons off his uniform, which were lovingly cared for by his unmarried sisters. They're here, as well as a bunch of carte de visites of, um, of Civil War generals, one of Robert Gould Shaw, which I challenge you to pick it out, uh, George McClellan. So there's some fun stuff up here, plus a copy of that book called Isn't This Glorious? So maybe that wraps it up. Thank you again, Tom. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. And refreshments is served, and Tom will still be here. <laughs>